Shanghai GDG is a very interesting、uh, developer community. I'm glad somebody has asked this question. I mean, this is where the magic happens. This is primarily a question and answer show. So, if any of you out there would like to ask questions. Well, welcome everyone.、Uh, my name is Pete LePage. I'm a developer advocate on the Chrome team, and、uh, with me today we have Paul Kinlan, who is here in London,、uh, joining、Hello. us, and、uh, we're here to talk about、uh, Chrome apps and talk about the networking stack.、Uh, we <coughs> kind of decided to do something a little bit different, a little bit fun this week.、Uh, this was actually Paul's idea to、uh, go a little bit deep and see if we could. Get a little bit meta, do something inside of something that normally hasn't been done before. So,、uh, Paul, why don't you、uh, introduce us to some of the new networking APIs that are available? Yeah, cool. So, yeah, I'm Paul Kinlan.、Uh, I'm based in London. You know, Pete. You know what we forgot to do? What is that? We got to look at, look at each other and high five each other across the internet. All right, all right. So we're ready. All right, I'm. We, I'm we good to go. We're good to go. Three, you ready? Two, all right. One, two, two, three. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, that was that was a complete, total, utter fail. But that's okay. That's it sounded、okay. good. <laughs> yeah, it sounded good, and we tried. You know, we tried, right? A for well, no. <laughs> so yes. Anyway, back on subject. We have a new set of APIs in Chrome. I think in the past that we've talked about the Chrome、uh, Socket API interface, and one big glare and omission、uh, from that API was the ability to listen on a port、uh, and bind it to it via UDP. That landed a little while ago, so you could build a server which、um, basically receives UDP input. And when we showed you the Air Drone demo about three, four weeks ago, I think,、um, you know that was using a UDP-based server. But again, the, the next omission from this whole API was the ability to actually in, in JavaScript and HTML build a server that is TCP-based inside the browser. So we now have the ability, and it landed recently. It's only experimental. It's only in Chrome Canary at the moment. But we re、uh, recently landed the ability to do listen and accept. <laughs> so listen and accept API calls inside Chrome. So what this enables you to do is basically build TCP-based servers. You could build an FTP server.、Uh, what we're going to talk about today, which is a web server, a web server that we've built and will be available on GitHub after the show.、Um, yeah, I mean it's pretty powerful, right? The fact that you can have a web server inside your web browser itself, inside your applications. Uh, I think it's been done by Opera, and I think Firefox has had some stuff, but now we've got it like pure access in JavaScript to be able to do these things. It's pretty exciting inside apps. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is, and you know, this is one of these things that I don't think really anybody's ever done before,、um, and accessing these things is really a powerful thing to be able to do. Yeah, it's pretty cool, right?、Yep. I mean, so we were we were kind of discussing you know, the different types of ideas, the things that we could do, and. You know, web server is the first one, right? You know, the first thing that most people try and do is a web server inside whatever it is.、Uh, listen on port eighty, or I can kind of get the get requests coming back in.、Um, but you could go even further. You could build an SMTP server.、Um, and the really important thing about these type of things, I, I I kind of miss saying this before, and I should have said it earlier on, is I think personally this is this is kind of really important for Chrome OS, right? We want people and developers to be able to use Chrome OS as a platform to be able to develop web applications and applications in general. And I think one of the things that has generally been missing is this ability to, when you're offline, connect to a local instance of a web server, build your application locally, your website locally, connect to it, and test it inside the browser. And I think this API, this this single API, the listen and accept APIs and the socket interface, they allow us to do those types of things. Yep. So it's going to be pretty cool in the future to see what comes out at least. Yep. Absolutely. So. Go ahead. Should we jump? Should we jump to a demo just to prove it does work and I'm not lying and kind of. Like bringing everyone on? Yeah, I think we should. Cool. All right, so we've got your screen up. People can see your screen. Yay!、Uh, okay, this is my app. It's a it's like a semi standalone application built with a Chrome app,、uh, okay. the Chrome app the Chrome app APIs, and what it allows us to do. And I'll just reload it because I was testing it before. Never to say I never come prepared. I was testing it before, so we'll pick a file. Uh, and it's this directory here, this app directory that I want to serve from my local machine、okay. uh, to obviously local connections. Press select, start. So the interesting thing about this, and I think I kind of like, oh, there, there's a big list of files that, that can actually it can actually serve. Is I've used the normal input type equals file attribute、uh, method. Sorry,、so、method. The directory. HTML tag. <laughs> yeah, the HTML5 tag.、Uh, Input、okay. type equals file with WebKit directory, so I can select directories. 
Um, that returns, obviously, on onChange. It gives us access to the list of files that we've selected. Yep. And I basically just take a reference to those file references, and then I'll serve them up uh, in the web or in locally. So 127, there we go. That's it. It's kind of simple. Watch it. Now live. This is an application that I made with Yeoman in about two seconds. Ooh. Nice okay. little plug to Yeoman. <laughs> um, but it's the basic application, right? It's not styled up. But the interesting thing is if we go to inspect element, uh, let me just detach that so we can see it inside the screen. And just to, to uh, mention this for folks who are interested, if they want to check out the code for this, they can go to uh, the URLs on the screen. You can go download the sample at uh, Google uh, AZSTG. Uh, mm -hmm. And you can sort of see that capitalization and all that kind of stuff there. But all right, sorry. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, no, that's cool. So we've we've just pushed it up to GitHub so people can go off and experiment with it now. Uh, the caveat is it's still experimental, so you need to enable experimental APIs and about flags, and it's also only available in Canary. But once you enable those two things, you can do you can actually play with this API. And if we look here, this is the code. Um, so I'm not the code, at least. Sorry, this is the list of requests just to prove that I'm actually making those requests from my local like resource. There's scripts forward slash vendor, for instance, forward slash modernizer.min.js. That's being served off my local file system via this interface. So it's pretty cool. It's pretty powerful. And we're going to show you actually how to, actually, actually how to build these things Sweet. Uh, today. So should we jump into code? Absolutely. Cool. Right? So as we can see here, I hope everyone can see my screen. Uh, the first thing that we need to do uh, when we're building this application is actually change the manifest. The reason why we need to do this uh, and I should have kind of got rid of this earlier on, is by default, we don't normally have experimental uh, permissions enabled inside our manifest. So if I just sorry, select this and see this here, you add experimental. This will enable you access to the socket, the advanced socket API. You then ask for a socket permission. And this is relatively new syntax. It landed maybe about a month ago. OK. Um, but it allows you to basically say and list different types of permissions that you want the socket interface to have inside your application. So if you're going to do UDP server or send UDP requests out from your client application to a remote server, um, you need to actually specify this upfront so that the user, when they install this application, they know the types of like the types of interactions with your native operating system that you're going to have. Yeah. Uh, in this case, yeah. we. I was sorry? going to say, Paul, is it so? If it's if I want to send UDP. I'm guessing it's probably not UDP connect and UDP listen, is no, it? No, it's not. It's it's UDP send uh, send to, I believe. And yeah. Also so it's, UDP, yep. UDP it, bind. UD, UDP send to to send packets, and then UDP bind will allow you to bind to a port to listen for new stuff coming yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah. And the syntax can get a little bit more complex. So you can basically, in theory, bind to just a single address uh, and a, on a special port. And what this is basically trying to say say to do here is that, well. If you just say TCP listen, you know your application could bind to any port on the user system that I believe is not under the root permission. So anything below uh, 1024, I think you can't bind to. But anything above that, you can. Um, but when you're doing a UDP send or a TCP connect, in theory, you could connect to port 22 for Telnet and you know port 80 for HTTP. Um, you just want to let the user know, for instance, how specific, like you know those types of services, yeah. uh, and kind of give them that little little bit of extra kind of trust. Um, that they get when they know the only things that they can access are the things that you've listed up front. But anyway, back oh, back on topic. The most important thing here is TCP listen. This is the new experimental permission that you need for the socket interface to be able to listen to ports and listen to incoming requests. Um, so if you add this in and you've already got a socket-based application, you should be good to go. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, straight away, oops, sorry. That doesn't mean straight away that you're going to be able to start taking requests. Obviously, you have to program the API. Um, so I just want to show you just to prove that all this is um, the same thing. Ignore this styling stuff. Um, but let me go to the next uh, input type equals file. This is the HTML that's involved in actually constructing our user interface. Input type equals file with an attribute of WebKit directory and just an ID called directory. Now, the reason why I do WebKit directory is if you've never actually done this before, normally input type equals file only lets you allow, only allows you to select one file um, from the from the user's file system. If you do input type equals file and then a multiple attribute, then <clears throat> you can select multiple files from the user system and get it brought back into your application. But if you do WebKit directory, WebKit directory basically gives you the entire um, list of files inside the directory that the user selected. So when we went to the app demo before. And we saw the fact that I selected the app folder. 
everything inside that folder was now available to my application to be able to read. We can't write to those applications. I mean, that's actually a subject for another Hangout altogether, is how to write to these files and actually you know, get access to them once you've actually got a reference to it. Um, but now it's only read-only. And to be fair, that's kind of all we really need for our basic web service, to be able to read files that are contained in a directory that the user has like, chosen and allowed you grant like, granted you access to. So anyway, let's jump to the code. Uh, Index.js is where it lives. And as you can see, I've already got a whole lot of boilerplate. I mean, a lot of this code is actually just hooking up user interface, uh, in user interface elements, and then also doing kind of string conversions. Because the interesting thing to know about the Socket API is it sends buffers, you know, array buffer objects. And the array buffer object is not something that we normally deal with inside JavaScript. Uh, yeah, we're I not used no, to that at all. Yeah. So yeah. what's what's the sort of difference between an array buffer and a string if I am sort of haven't really played with those before? Yeah, so I mean the main difference between like an array buffer and a string essentially is the fact that I mean if you've then ever done any kind of binary manipulation on a string inside JavaScript, you know how hard it is. It's like you have to take the high order byte and the low order byte because it's UTF sixteen, I think, and you have to do a whole lot of manipulation just to access yeah. the raw data. Yep. And the array buffer is basically it allows you to have multiple different types of views on a piece of data. So you can say, my entire data that's contained in this array buffer is of uint array type, uh, or uint 8 array, uint 16 array, uint 32 array. So you, have, you can say your array is of different types of data. Mm. But essentially, what it allows you to do is say, well, my view on this array buffer is an array of 8-bit integers, essentially. And that allows you to then say, well, we just read through the bytes individually. So as you can see here, uh, if we go here, the view, uh, we create a new uh, array based on the array buffer uh, of type view intate array. And then we just iterate across it and basically <clears throat> convert our string. Sorry, we convert our string into a uint data array. So we're basically going to iterate across our string and then pushing that value that's held in the array directly into the actual array buffer itself. OK. And that's kind of cool because then you can do, uh, you know, you can handle big Indian and little Indian. You know, when you're kind of delivering data, yep. it's super important for the socket API because, you know, the majority of time we're not really sending strings around. If we're doing a web socket, for instance. You might want to send a string because it's an adjacent structure and that's fine. But actually, at the raw con, like the raw level for the socket API, you send raw binary data. Um, and so that's why we need these extra little functions. Uh, we also have a array buffer to string, uh, which we just use to basically convert. Obviously, an array buffer, the data that we receive back from a service to a string. Right. And the reason, the reason why we use this is that we have to pass out, for instance, the when a HTTP request comes in, there's a very like there's a very specific kind of set of headers that you get through, and passing them in binary, like actually byte by byte, is just a bit of a pain. Yep. So I convert it to a string and do some work onto it. You'll see that there's probably a big glaring security hole in it where I just basically read the whole string, and if you send a big enough set of headers, like a thousand megabytes or gigabytes of headers my application will probably crash. Um, but just to demonstrate the purpose of this yep. uh, web server to guys, we're kind of ignoring all that type of stuff. All right. Yeah, and I think that's one other thing to point out. We wrote this uh, as a, a really quick sample, not as something that is meant to be used as you know a key thing that you should copy everything from and, and sit down and write, write a web server using this. Um, we just wanted to sort of get some of the concepts across and yeah. There's there's a few things we could have done better. A few things we could have done well, worse. Well, I mean, I mean, the demo is only going to show you how to handle GET requests. Yeah. <laughs> so if you want to do cross origin and uh, you know uh, like post puts yeah. and everything else, that's not going to work at the moment. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the concept is that you can build a web server entirely in JavaScript that lives inside your browser. The way the place I always like this, um, and I, the, I don't think they're ever going to do it, but the App Engine kind of SDK uploader. Yep. Uh, you can kind of get your dev environment. If you can basically run a half, like run Python with mscripten or what other technologies you want to use, you can have like the app engines like mini system just run inside the browser and upload. Um, that's like where I'd like to get to in like ten years time. Well, that's actually, in ten, in ten years time, I'd like to be retired and living on the beach somewhere. But well, yeah. <laughs> well, how about then? Yeah. In nine years time, you get that done, and then um, in ten yes. years you can retire because everybody just thinks that's so awesome and they just you know make it happen. Yeah, I think that's good. I think it's really good. Should we do it? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> done. Cool, done. Let's ship it. Um, right. I just say I'm not pre-announcing anything. <laughs> um, so anyway, on that subject. <laughs> 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 so let's just jump through the code, right? This right. is 
This is before the nitty gritty, right? I just want to show you the, the rest of the infrastructure that I've got ready for you guys. Um, directory got on change. It's not the nicest way that we handle events, but we're only going to bind to it once. And I just thought for brevity, it was going to be uh, easier for everyone to understand. Uh, when the user actually picks a directory, we get the on change event. In that on change, we can get an access to a list of files uh, done by this this uh, little this, this little line of code, line 58, e.target.files. That's a list of files inside the directory that the user has chosen. Uh, we just iterate across them. We take the WebKit relative path, which gives us basically a relative path. It doesn't give us the full directory structure, just the root of where it is, which is absolutely fine for a web server, because we only ever deal really with absolute uh, absolute paths inside our own web app. Uh, and then we just map that into, we take the path, map it into basically a hash, uh, so that whenever the, like a web request comes in, I can then go and easily pick the file up from my in-memory store and serve that back out to the user. So that's all there is from actually getting access to the file system. Uh, it's not the full file system. It's just the directory and all the subdirectories that the user has chosen. But we can do some nice things. We can kind of serve them up inside our application. Yeah, and to um, be clear, this is the HTML5 file system, or is this the file system access that this, comes with this is the Chrome app? Users, this is the, no, no, it's neither, actually. <laughs> hey. Um, so we have a couple of different types of file systems living in the user's device, basically. We have the HTML5 file system, which is entirely sandboxed yep. uh, and only available to that application in that domain. Uh, and all the files are obfuscated and a whole load of other stuff, so you can't go and easily pass the files out uh, on the user's local machine. Uh, we also have the, what was the, what was the second one you asked? Uh, um, the Chrome Apps file system. Yeah, so we have the Chrome Apps file system. It's similar to, I'll tell you what, it's similar to the Chrome Apps file system API. The, the Chrome Apps file system API and the Media Gallery API essentially allow you to get elevated access to those directories. So if you're using the file system API, you can basically say, well, the user's given me a file, and I've got a reference to that. I want to write back to it. And we don't need that in our application, so we're not using that part of the API. But it's using the same file object that you get back from the system. Um, this is literally the user's own file system itself. Okay. So it's it's pretty cool. Uh, it's just the file system, but it's only the directory that they've, they, they've actually given you access to. So let's actually get into the code, right? Start to onclick. This is the thing that is going to start the server. So it's pretty simple, right? We've already got the permissions ready, so we're going to not call it iSocket, because that's me being silly with uh, BIM. We're going to create a socket of TCP type uh, with no extra information supplied, and then just take a function callback and call, I don't know, socket info. So this is the very start of the things that most people do when they're building a socket-based interface or an application, is they need to create a socket. Right. So we need to do a little bit more of that, because that's not actually done. that's not actually doing anything. Um, for, for ease of use later on, I'm going to bind the socket information that we get uh, to a global variable. Again, it's not the best type of code, but it's just, you know, it's simple. It works. Yep. Um, we're going to then upgrade our socket to a server socket. Uh, so we're going to say listen. And if we do listen, socket, oh, God, sorry. I apologize. Uh, socket info dot uh, socket ID. This is basically saying, for the socket that we've just created, we're going to turn it into a server socket. It doesn't mean much yet, because we haven't got an address to bind it to. I'm just going to bind it to localhost on port 8081. This is untested now, so 8081, um, just to prove that my demo later on is going to work. Uh, and we're going to allow 20 requests to come through at a time. So that's the, pretty much all you have to do to get started to make it to server socket. But the thing is, it's not that interesting once you do that. You basically want to get a notification that it's all worked and everything is fine. So if, we, if we've done it right, uh, console.log, uh, I don't know, listening, listen. You know I can't spell. I found in the past few weeks that my, uh, my spelling is absolutely atrocious. Uh, I just noticed a spelling mistake. Result. Result. So basically, the console will just log the fact that we made a connection and everything's fine. Uh, if it's not fine, we'll get an error here and an exception, so we won't be able to do anything else. And now what we need to do is be able to list, start to listen and accept our first um, connection coming in. So let's just go over this a little, a little bit, because there's a lot that's gone on um, in a relatively short amount of time. So in this case, we've, we've made our socket, created it. It's there. It's ready. The system knows about it. Yep. And then we've just said listen. So the idea here normally is in a in a client application you do connect. 
Uh, you create a socket and then you connect to a remote service or you send some data via a UDP request. Mm -hmm. um, that's not what we're doing. That's a client application. This is a service application, a server application. So we're just saying listen, listen on port one, well, listen on IP address 127.0.0.1 uh, on port 8081. Now, I've, I've hard coded in 127 just because it's it just illustrates the point. You can actually get a list of the network interfaces. Um, and let the user choose which server, like which, which IP address. IP address they want, or which network adapter they want to listen on. Yeah, essentially, yeah. yeah. So that then lets you get the IP address, and then you can listen on a public IP address if your browser was, well, if, you're, if you've been silly. Multi-homed or something like that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I mean, I normally, if, they, if you've got like a local network and you want to try and connect to it, then you can bind to your Ethernet card or your Wi-Fi adapter, yep. and then have the requests come in. Well, you know, this could be an interesting scenario for those people who want to write a proxy server at home and have a proxy server set at home that they could go and just sort of basically write something that proxies out network connections effectively. Yeah. Yeah, actually, you could, you could actually do that. That's actually pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, and it's all done by JavaScript HTML. Exactly. And, and all that type of stuff. That's so one badass. of the things I want to call out here that when I first started writing some of these network connection things, it took me a second to go, oh, great, I love this, is that you do get into a bit of uh, callback fun, right? So mm -hmm. on the create, it actually has a callback that says, once it's created, call this function. Then yeah. once you've created the socket, then you actually have to tell the socket what to do, right? So you actually have to go and, and sort of work with a couple of different pieces. So when you look at this, remember to sort of think through, OK, what's this callback going to do? How's this going to work uh, in each of these pieces? Yeah. I think that's the important thing, right? I mean, this is we're just using the callbacks here because it's it ke keeps everything in one block. Yeah. You probably want to do a bind, and you basically just kind of pass everything, like modulize your kind of JavaScript a little bit better than we're going to do today. Yeah. Uh, and basically, just bind and let the kind of the object and scope go kind of flow through the function calls. Yeah. The 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 interesting thing is that this is a common problem that JavaScript developers do, and if you're using Node, uh, for instance, you're, there's a whole lot of NPM modules which I try to make asynchronous uh, callback management a lot easier. Yep. Um, can I call that an open challenge? Absolutely. I don't know. I, I don't know how I'm going to do this just yet, <laughs> uh, but I would absolutely love to see the. Now that we're getting kind of some parity between the features and functionality available in Node.js, is if we could leverage some of the functionality that people have built into Node, whether it's you know connect, uh, you know, so even like the WebSocket servers and all this type of stuff. Um, all these functions, if we can write a, like a light wrapper around the APIs that are in Node. Uh, that'll be brilliant if you just get imported into Chrome, and then we've got like a similar ecosystem across the server, and then also across the browser. Like what you know is like kind of your server inside the browser. Yeah. Um, which on the client would be pretty powerful then, and we've got a big ecosystem of uh, application functionality then available to developers. Yeah. Absolutely. I'd love it. it. Yeah, it'd be cool. You know, get Meteor on. That'd be brilliant. Meteor in the browser, talking to the browser. Yep. Sweet. <laughs> um, yeah. I was gonna I was gonna say I'll buy someone a Nexus Seven if they do that, but I don't think I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> no, prob probably not. Well, unless you wanted to buy yourself an Nexus 7. I would 7 buy it myself, actually. If someone did it and they did it, I'd, I'd buy them an Nexus 7. All right. Well, so just to be <laughs> clear, it's not a promise, but I think if, if they show some something pretty cool, I think I think there might be uh, I will be good recognition grateful. for them. Yes. Yes, definitely. <laughs> All right. So let's hop uh, back into the code. I'm, yeah, I'm trying to work out how much trouble that we're going to be in. Well, I'm going to be in now. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so so let's jump in, right? So we've got the connection. I'm, and I'm really sorry about going up and down through the code. I just made a little mistake then. Um, so I'll just jump in, right? Let's split the window so you can see the code. This is why I like Vim. It's cool. Um, but also, your preferred text editor is also cool. I'm not going to get into a war about this. Uh, the interesting I was going to say, I think Sublime is awesome, but you know. Yeah, no, whatever, yeah. Whatever exactly. floats your boat. Um, <laughs> actually, while you while you uh, get yourself set up there, I do want to mention one thing real quick. If you if people who are watching this have questions, they want to know uh, maybe a little bit deeper. Please post your questions on Moderator. The link is uh, there on screen right now. You can just go to Moderator and and post a few questions, and we'll take those questions as we get towards the end of the session today. Yeah, that's pretty cool. We we got one or two. Uh, yeah, we two got a couple right. good ones. Um, right. Which we'll all be able to answer as well. It's like we want, we, yeah, they're going to be good. Absolutely. Um, so, so stay tuned. Yeah, let's go back to the code. Um, I apologize. Two seconds again. Hey. One one thousand. 
Pro to 1,000. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna give you trouble. Yeah, dude. I'm ready. Don't worry. All right. All right. <laughs> All you then. Suspense. I was adding to the suspense. So we talked about it before. Socket accept. Accept takes a connection that's come in like off the off the queue and then allows you to process it. So in theory, we have this here. So we, we say I need to accept the connection that's come in from socket. Uh, the, the particular socket that we created. And there's a callback called on accept, and we're going to jump to on accept now and kind of fill that out because what actually happens is it's kind of interesting this part of the API, and it's something that I found a little bit confusing when I first played with it is you can only call accept once, and you can only process one request that's coming in at a time. So it's very kind of um, single threaded in this sense. So if you're doing a whole lot of processing and someone's uploaded like a big file to your socket, then what you should really do is try and delegate that some off, like delegate that work off to like a, a web worker or something similar to that. Very much like you do in Node, essentially, you just kind of do maintain the asynchronicity at least. On accept is the callback that happens when we know we've got some data that's come back in. So the very first request time we do this, there's going to be nothing happening because I haven't gone back to my browser and actually made a request. Um, but when I do make a request, on accept will be called, and what we need to do is we need to jump up to my previous window and start filling this out. Now, what we do here is actually we read the data from the socket into our application. The reason why we do that, I mean, we don't have to, um, but otherwise it'd be a pretty rubbish application, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to call a simple, and there's a lot of code in here, so please follow along. Uh, um, it's going to be a bit awkward. So accept info dot, uh, socket ID uh, function read info. And this is where you're going to see all the callbacks that we mentioned earlier on. Oh, goody. Oh, good. Yeah, it's awesome. So what we've done here is now that we know that we've been called, our app, you know, we've made a, like a connection's been made to our server. We say we we'll need to read from the socket. Notice how we're using we are using accept info socket, not socket info as the variable. Um, this is because the actual request that come in that's come in uh, basically isn't on the same socket as the one that you're listening on. The way that the underlying system works is it delegates it back off to the system, and then it's like a separate channel that enables you to communicate back to the service. So we've got a different socket. Um, but that's fine. We'll read through it. We do call the read. And in theory, what you'd see here now is, um, I'm just going to put it in so we know. You would see all the data that's come back in. Read info itself uh, has got a data property. So let's just get it off. Um, actually, let's convert it to a string first. Array buffer to string. And this is a function that I've made myself. Um, it's not in the core library system. But there we go, right? So the idea behind this now is that we've gone through, um, got the data out, called array buffer to string, which um, is here. We basically take the array buffer, convert it to a string, and the reason why we do this is because because wait for it, uh, I'm waiting, we go. I'm waiting. We need to read from it. <laughs> so what I do is I say, yeah, this is exciting. Index of uh, so we need to find the very first part of the string. I'm going to put a space in there because it could be wrong. Uh, equals zero. And this is basically the HTTP header that we've got back in. So we've re we're reading from the request. We're assuming that it's a HTTP request. When it is a HTTP request, uh, the very first set of characters in the, the stream are the actual method that's going to be called. Not the kind of the, the underlying method, but the post, get, put, delete, all those types of things. And in this case, we're just going to look for the word, in, the word get. We're not going to handle anything else. Um, that's pretty cool. So if we get the word get there, we've got a good, there's a, there's a strong likelihood at least that the data is a HTTP request. So let's parse it a little bit more. And I'm going to make it take a whole load of liberties with this. Um, we're going to get the start of the URI. So the, or the end of the URI. So the thing that comes after the get request, uh, and I'm sorry for doing like a HTTP 101 here, but uh, the thing that comes after the get request is actually the URL that you're fetching. Um, so sub substrung um, URIN. So we're just going to pass this out, and we're going to just assume that it all works. And we're then going to get the file from our files map, um, which that's what we said before. When we click on the directory, the, like the file picker button, we have a directory. <coughs> excuse me. We have uh, the ability to select a directory. We take all those files in that directory and store them in a hash with the your like the URL basically of the local file system, and then we map that on using this. So uh, if we have, like, what we'll see here is if a web request comes into our server, uh, forward slash index.html, uh, we'll see that we'll get the URI out, and then we'll look for a file called index.html in our memory collection of files, which is pretty cool. And then 
this is going to look silly um, because it doesn't exist yet, but write response is a function that we've made. Um, info dot, uh, socket ID file. Right, this is just a function that we made, and we're going to go to it now. Uh, write 200 So response. before you uh, pop down there, uh, yeah. you've got file, col uh, where you've got your file. When you went to hit uh, your semicolon, you actually got an A in there at the end of Dude. that line. Thank you go. very much. Well, uh, well, now we got an R. It's and gone now. It should be that. Write 200 response. Now, why is it write 200 response versus write response? Um, th basically, there was just the way I decided to try and structure the application. I was going to say that if I can't find the file, yep. I would try and write a 400 response uh, go now. Um, it just, from the, like, the verbosity of it, it kind of made sense when you were looking at it um, to say write 200 response. Write response with a status code would probably be better. Um, Fair, fair enough. OK. But no, we can refactor this. And if anyone wants to take the code, fork it, and make it look um, a lot nicer, then super fine by me. That'd be so super this cool. Is, yeah, this is our function. Uh, we take the socket ID. So the socket ID, this is the, like, the socket, the network socket, the network port that we're going to write back to the client, so the, write back to the web browser um, with the data on. So we have the file. We're going to work out the content type. Luckily, the file object, in a lot of cases, has the content type on. Um, I've just assumed that if the content type doesn't exist, it's called text plain. Um, it's probably not the best assumption, but it was reasonable. Uh, content length, we, it's, it's, you're a good web citizen if you put the content length on. Uh, so we get the file size. So the, the actual size of the file is stored in the file system object, which is pretty cool. And then we do this thing called header. We make a header. And the reason why is because when you do a network response, you have to put a HTTP header at the top. And then you also, at the bottom, you have to then put the file contents. And the HTTP header, basically says what type of protocol you're using, whether it's HTTP 1, 1.1. The status code, 200 in this case. Um, 200 is a success and the word OK. And then some extra information like content length and content type. Now, we're using the inverse of a string to array buffer. We use, oh, sorry. Um, the of inverse array to string buffer. Before. We're using string to array buffer. We're now making an array buffer now. So it's converting this single string that we've got, which is a collection of the header information, essentially, um, to we're take, basically taking that data, making an array buffer so that we can type, uh, so that we can send that out to the client. Now, the interesting thing, the way I've done this, and it's probably not the best way again, is I've just assumed that I want to glob all the data, the header and the response, into one, uh, one write. I don't have to do that. I probably shouldn't do that that way. But uh, anyway, we have an output buffer, which is the combination of the HTTP header and the actual file body itself, the raw file data that we're going to pull back in. Now, we have this. Um, Excuse me. So we have the view. Now the view is this thing. It's basically just the way that you can actually put data into an array buffer. You can't put data into an array buffer directly, so we have to do some work. Uh, the array buffer itself is yeah, like it's the header length plus the file length. We put the header at the very start of the the very start of the file uh, the um, the array buffer, which is what you need. And then we need to put the body at the end. Now the interesting thing here is this is the asynchronous bit again. Uh, you have to use a file reader. The HTTP uh, the HTTP the HTML5 file reader API, because we've got a file object, we don't have access to the bytes. We need to basically ask the system to give us that information. So we use the file reader API in this case. Um, it's one simple call, file reader, listen to onload, so we know that the file has been loaded up and it's all ready to go. Um, and we then finally say read as an array buffer. So the file object can be returned as an array buffer. And the idea behind what we're going to do now is once the file data has come in, we're going to stuff that into the array buffer itself right at the end after the header. So we have this one big glob of data that we're just going to send out to the client. So you don't Paul, need to do one it. of the things, uh, if someone wanted to refactor this, one way they could do it to make it potentially a much faster web server is on startup when it reads that directory, it could load, all, depending on how many files there are, it could load all of those files into memory. Yeah and then just keep them there so that it just always was able to immediately respond with them. and have Yeah, so we, I mean, it, it, it seems a little heavyweight to do what we're doing right now, honestly. Yep. Um, but it's just kind of there to show the point. Yep. Um, but the other thing as well is you can actually do two writes, two socket writes, sending the data back over the socket. Um, you could do two, two writes. So you could write the header and then write the body just after. That's like two asynchronous calls. It's a little bit hard to orchestrate, but then we don't have to block the user interface on kind of like trying to construct these two larger objects together. Right. And we actually, Though and admittedly, about, in this app, there isn't much of a user interface. So blocking on that would not be a huge deal. But yeah. you still don't want to do that. 
Yeah, exactly. Um, so let's go and see where we can go from here. So we want to do socket dot write. So we're going to write to the socket, write the data from the file system API to uh, the web, essentially. Um, it's pretty cool. cool. Uh, this should be simple. Socket ID, output buffer. Uh, be careful how I spell, spell that one out. Uh, function write info. And again, another nice, very cute callback. Aw, gotta love yeah. these callbacks. Uh, I believe that is not needed. Um, and in theory, that's it, right? But we want a little bit more information. So we, we've taken the data, and we've constructed the header response and also the body response. We just, like, we've just we written it out in one go. To be a good citizen, actually what we need to do uh, is actually destroy the socket. So what is one of the things that I found out when I was doing this is like the number of sockets, if you don't destroy them once that you've finished the connection and you've written the data out and you're happy that the client's got the data, um, if you, you basically the application will probably crash at some point in the future. Yeah, um, but there, the are, there are a limited number of sockets, so just yeah, essentially, yeah. Essentially now, do files. you need to destroy and close or just destroy? Uh, you might need to close. I just did destroy, and it seems to work. Um, right. I should probably be a better citizen and also close it as well. But what I'm doing here, right? This this is the this is the thing that got me before when I was starting this. Because overall, it took me about like an hour and a half to make this whole application. It's pretty cool. Um, Socket dot accept. You need to call that again because you've handled the request. You basically need to tell the system that you want to pick off the next request again. Um, mm. And because you can only have one of those in flight, it's. I chose to do it in this type of queue here um, because you can only have one in flight. I need to know that what we've done has com has completed successfully. Um, in which case, it's the right. And in theory, oh, I'll tell you what, that should be it. Let me just go to the end. I know there's a stop button. Uh, we should also do socket dot destroy to kill the server socket um, uh, info dot socket id, um, and that is all we actually need to do. We have right. our server. Should we test it? Let's test it. Should we test it live? I absolutely. Uh, so I have an extension web server file. Uh, it's not that one. It's not that one. That was my test. That was all my other test. Uh, <laughs> hey, on air. There right? we go. So it hasn't crashed yet. Sweet. Uh, launch. Uh, should we see if there's any errors? No errors so far. Uh, okay, choose files. Uh, choose that app directory. Nice. Nice. No errors. Start. No errors. Oh. No whammy, right. no whammy, no whammy, no whammy. Uh, 81, because. Yay! <laughs> it worked. Congratulations. Nice job, sir. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's it, right? That That's the whole basic premise of what we're trying to, we're, we're trying to do with this. Uh, in like 30 minutes, uh, and we've gone through this, and we're talking, obviously, a long time here. Uh, we built a basic server that allows you to serve uh, data from your local machine, your local Chrome OS box, your MacBook, all those types of things. Serve it directly to the user offline, online. However you want to do it, you can do it. Um, obviously, it's a very simple server. It only handles GET requests. Uh, yep. It doesn't do posts and all that type of stuff. But you can kind of see what's going to happen. And like I said, if, if we can get some of the node-based interfaces and the, ser like the server work that a lot of people have already done in that, like, yeah. in that whole ecosystem, uh, I know there's a quite a bit of mapping that needs to be done because there's a buffer. Which is different to our array buffer and all that type of stuff. So, you know, there needs to be some marshalling and kind of munging yep. between the kind of the two bits there. Um, and I think that's one of those things. Like, it'd be so cool if you could, you know, you could test your entire stack without a node, like necessarily having to have a Node.js server installed. Which is, you on your MacBook Pro and your Windows machine, you'll you'll have that on anyway. But if you're on a Chrome OS box right now, it's like right. that'd be pretty sweet if you could start to kind of test out your node-based application inside the browser from your Chrome OS machine. Exactly. Or you could effectively go and just do any of the development that you want to do on your Chromebook, right? Yeah. And have a have a server running locally. Uh, mm -hmm. So I just put the URL for uh, the network documentation up on screen. So if you want to dive into this a little bit deeper, you can see the, the URL there. And that'll take you to the Chrome Apps documentation, where all of this stuff uh, goes into much more detail all of the different APIs, the connect, the destroy, the close, all of those fun things that you do kind of yeah. need to know about. So um, the, the, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. 
Yeah, the thing I'd just like to say is that this API is pretty cool. It's very powerful. Um, it's something that we've not seen inside Chrome before, at least. Um, but the, the thing for me is it's going to enable so many more use cases. It's going to be really cool. Yeah. And so like, personally, I'd like more higher level APIs. Yeah. So someone could make like an FTP API or a DNS API and all those type, different types of APIs that other developers can just use and say, you know what? I want to connect to an FTP client or an FTP service. Or yep. I want to make it my own FTP service. Yep. And it just works. Absolutely. I love that to happen. That'd be absolutely brilliant. So actually, that's a that's a perfect segue into some of the questions because one of the first questions that uh, that's in there is, uh, could you summarize at a high level what the new use cases uh, you see in enabling in our apps are, um, and any particular use cases that you want to see? So I know yeah. for me, uh, there's a couple that I've been playing with lately. Uh, things like there's a little box that you can buy called an IP to IR. <laughs> converter. And I've just yes. been playing with this. I know it's completely dorky, but it's basically, uh, so it plugs into your network port, and then it's got uh, IR blasters on it. So you can then use that to control your TV, your anything that, that's controlled via IR. So I'm working on writing a little uh, Chrome app that will allow me to turn my air conditioner on and off, will allow me to turn the TV on and off, do all sorts of crazy little things like that. So that's one case. But other things are being able to write uh, servers, like we talked about, being able to go and communicate with uh, appliances that you normally wouldn't be able to communicate with. Yeah. What are some of the ones that you're excited about, Paul? Uh, use cases or appliances? Uh, both. Both. Appliances, oh, so many. I, I really like the idea. So we've got a demo for the media center. Yep. Is I want to be able to access all my media around my house, um, bring into my Chrome app, and if I go on a plane, um, I can just download it straight to my Chromebook and still play it and listen to it. It's pretty cool. So yeah. we've got that type of demo. That type of interaction is like, that's like something we just don't get in the browser, right? right yeah. Now. And it's yeah. pretty cool. The uh, some of the other stuff. So services and actual where this is important for me. You know, literally, I want I want us to be able to build services and services uh, in our applications. I think one of the questions is, I should have built a BitTorrent client. Yeah. You know, we can build a BitTorrent client. I just I don't know how to do it. I don't know the protocol. <laughs> Probably would have been a little bit long for this this um, talk. Um, but you know, those are the types of things that we are enabled to do now in the sense that we can have a BitTorrent client and you could, in theory, just open the ports that you need, listen to the requests coming in to share the data back out. Um, so you could quite easily do it. Well, I say easily. I think the API is there for you to be able to do that. Um, yeah. That would be pretty cool. Uh, FTP services, uh, uh, FTP servers, FTP clients. You know, there's so many people who still actually use FTP, like web developers who use FTP, Absolutely. not even FTPS. I like yep. just plain FTP to like, get their data around the place uh, and up on the web hosts, those type of things. Yep. I was actually thinking it might have been cool for like a curl on the web. Um, you always see these things like curl on the web where you'll um, not, not serve it necessarily, but like a but like a normal client request. Uh, just like debug the HTTP requests. Yep. Um, without having to go into dev tools, you can just kind of put it all in, and you don't need the remote server to do it. You can do all that type of stuff. Yeah. The the interesting thing we don't have any access to the really really low layers of the API. So you can't do ping, so that ICMP stuff, you can't do. Okay. Uh, but you can do DNS, you can do you know, DNS clients. I want a whole load of APIs available, high-level APIs yeah. uh, available. Just let, let me just fire off a DNS request or network time request. Yeah. You know, all these types of things would be cool. Yeah. And then we can build some really cool applications on it. Um, the first one that always sprung to mind, and this is, I think, why we did the web developer, kind of the web server, is because web developers, this is something the web developers want to be able to do on their Chromebooks. Yeah, absolutely. So I think we can enable that. It'd be pretty cool if someone like Cloud9 or someone else comes along and says, yeah, uh, we can do that while you're offline. That'd we'll, be cool. We'll pop that into your into our development environment. <laughs> so yeah. uh, Luis from Phoenix wants to know, uh, is, uh, is there a way to do, uh, to do a broadcast to find other servers uh, to use this uh, for LAN-based HTML5 game servers? And the answer is yes. Um, Right now, there's a bug with uh, UDP listen on the broadcast port, so that's mm -hmm. not going to work, and, and the engineers are, are aware of that, and they're looking into that one. But you can certainly, uh, once that gets fixed, you'll be able to much more, or you'll be able to listen for uh, UDP ping, or U UDP broadcast sent out. Yeah. Yeah, so our media, our media gallery sample uh, on GitHub, yep. that actually does that type of thing, but it's, it's kind of a little bit broken at the moment. Um, the, the thing it does, it basically fires off of, I think it's 239.245.255 uh, address, which yep. is like the UDP broadcast, essentially, for UPnP discovery. Um, and, or DNLA, sorry. And then basically, it will fire that off. That's fine. You can do the broadcast. But the other end, you need to be able to listen. Um, and like uh, Pete said, yeah, that API, it, it did work. 
Um, but I think someone stopped working recently. But you should be able to bind, you do a UDP bind um, to a port zero and then receive all these responses back in. Yep. So that should all work. Uh, so uh, we've got another question of how many requests can it handle at a time? If you have to dis destroy and start accepting again, does that mean you can only re uh, accept one request at a time? Yes, is the answer right now. Only one request at a time. Uh, but if you look at the way kind of Node works, it's relatively similar, right? I mean, Node only processes one request, tries to then delegate the rest of the functionality to other asynchronous parts of the system, and then handle the responses that way. Uh, and if you look at the Python tor uh, Tornado server, it was a similar thing. You can only handle one request at a time coming in. So yeah, right now, that's the, the, only, the only way you can do it just yet. Um, the idea is that you would take the request and either kind of background it. I mean, all these APIs are asynchronous. So you know, we might actually be able to take multiple ones uh, earlier on. Um, I'm trying to think how the accept works now. I haven't actually tested it with trying to delegate the, like, finish the accept off really early. So just say, you know what, we finished with the accept. Go off and do whatever you want. Yep. Um, I haven't tried that just yet, but right now it's one, uh, one at a time. Yeah. Um, it's, pretty, it's pretty speedy for what we're trying to do is basic file serving, but yeah. Um, you know, yeah, these this, are the is, this is something that I think works perfectly for a development environment or a little test environment or maybe something you want to write for uh, controlling of an application like the IP to IR controller where you're only going to have a couple people connecting to it at any time. You're not going to have the entire world. It's not designed to uh, in this particular case to scale. Now you absolutely could write scale with yeah. this stuff, but the way we've written it won't scale well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the way I've written this application probably won't scale well at all. Um, I, I, I think it's a very general, uh, what was I going to say? It's a very general um, API. It's the, it's the POSIX socket API, essentially. So we can build systems which scale quite easily. Um, this literally only landed like last week. And what we're trying to do is start off the conversation about kind of getting developers excited about this API. And then we'll start to build out the patterns and practices about how this should actually be managed. Um, you know, from the application layer, if that makes sense. Um, so we're still early on, and you know, if you guys want to play with it, you just email me, Paul Kinnon at Google, or catch me on Google Plus, um, or Twitter, yep. and yeah, we'll just kind of like we'll try and do another show where we'll promote some of these things, uh, some of the stuff that you do as well. So that'd be pretty cool. But we need to know how you want to use these things, and the only way we'll know that is by getting you guys to experiment. Yeah. Um, so I encourage everyone to have a look. Like, yep. So uh, we've got uh, time for, I think, about one or two more questions. Um, question was, uh, does this work over the internet? And yeah, it absolutely would. The one thing you have to be aware of is that the network uh, socket that you're listening on has to be connected to an internet port, right? So in our particular yeah. case, we're listening to 127.0.0.1. So we're listening for our own sort of loop back. But Paul could have said, hey, what's the IP address on my network port? And I want to listen on that. And then I could have, from here in New York, connected to him and been able to listen to that. But yeah. I would have had to been able to get to his uh, IP address. Yeah. Yeah, it's the same as just general networking, so it should be fine. Cool. Um, yeah. Um, is there a, can we do one more question, or are we over time? I think we're over time now, aren't we? Yeah, I think we're a little bit over time. So uh, yeah. with that, I want to say uh, thanks to Paul for joining me, and thank you guys for all joining us. Um, we'll be back next week with another installment of uh, Chrome Apps. Um, if there are things you want to hear about, things you want us to cover in more depth, please be sure to reach out to us, either through uh, our own uh, Google Plus pages. I'm Pete LePage, and, or you can reach to Paul Kinlan. Or leave a mm -hmm. comment in the uh, uh, one of our Google Plus pages for the Chrome developers. So with that, uh, Paul, I think we should try for another uh, high five. All right, ready? Three, two, one. What? Yeah. Uh, yes. All right. That no, was kind of that, that was a lot better than the first time we tried it. So uh, all right, everybody. Thanks very much. Hope you have a wonderful day, and uh, talk to you soon. Bye bye. Thank you.